I'll ask you to find your place as we begin this morning, and I am so glad to see you. Seems like forever since some of you have been seen, and I'm glad to have the Willoughby family. Good to see all of them. Good to have Amy back, because she was sick as well. So what a blessing. I, I may have missed somebody, but good to have you all here. As far as prayer requests goes, please be praying for our pastoral search progress, which is moving forward. Remember our ladies who have lost their husbands. The husbands are now with the Lord, and someday we will be all reunited. What a blessing that will be. Pray for our humanly impossible, unspoken prayer requests that we have been remembering. We thank the Lord for that. Then I want to thank the Bendinskys for their work in decorating and then undecorating our Christmas. We appreciate you folks for doing that. Pray for Jerry and Amy, if you would. Uh, Jerry is about the same. Amy has been diagnosed with macular degeneration, and it's the type where she can't get the shots like I do, and I think Mary does as well. We go to the same doctor. Uh, pray for Bill and Gloria. He's not doing well at all. We want to remember John Herrick. He is now at home and recovering. Pray for Wendell, who's unable to be here, but would really like to. And then for Daryl. He has got a battle with gout, and it is very painful. So we're praying for you, friend. Remember also Neil Clack. Patty and I have an appointment to see him this week. And pray for him. We're glad that Leon is able to be here. Pray for Leon, and then pray for Linda. He said that she's doing well. Remember Karen North, she had a fall last week, I believe, and broke her kneecap. So she had to have surgery, and she now is at home, and in a brace, and a cane, and pain. So remember Karen in prayer. We just need to remember all of these. Our missionaries of the week, are Bob and Patsy Green, and we do not have an update on them for this new year, because of course we just got into it. So remember Bob and Patsy, very faithful missionaries that have served the Lord forever. So I'll ask Joel to come and pray. It is uh, good to be back. Um, it's quite a, quite a trip, very thankful for the time we had with my parents and all of us were together. So it was mom and dad and it was Jonathan and his wife, Kato and the kids and Lauren and her husband, Dan. Uh, and there were 17 of us in the house. Um, of the 17, during the 10 days we were there, I think uh, 13 or 14 of us got sick. It was still good. Uh, we had a three day blizzard. It was still good. Uh, and then one of our kids got the flu on the way home and it was still good. Uh, and double ear infection. <laughs> So we have been through the ringer. Um, I, I won't share necessarily from here to take too much time. We also had a pretty crazy uh, medical scare this week. Uh, if, if Bonnie can, or I can tell you the story, we are, everything is fine. The Lord has um, just brought peace to our hearts, uh, but we had a pretty, pretty crazy scare that we are praising the Lord that it's not what we thought it was, would be. Um, uh, just to give a few updates on a, a couple missionaries. Mom and dad are home, so they made it home from, from the States. Uh, it's summer down there, so hopefully they don't then that trigger sickness for them. Um, and uh, But also, if, if you're on Facebook, you've seen John uh, Herrick, as Pastor mentioned, is home. Uh, he was able to see his grandchild, a baby that was just born, to, um, to Abby, to Abigail. Um, and um, Oh, and the PVs will be here towards the end of the month. So we are excited to host them and see them real, real soon. So a lot of, a lot of neat things happening, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we are so very grateful for the season of Christmas that we just went through, Lord, and thankful for being able to be with family, thankful for those who were able to also be with family, and, and Lord, praying for, for those who perhaps weren't able to, to see family or are missing family, and but we know that some of these holiday times can could be uh, very uh, painful or bring back memories, and we pray for those that you bless, that you'd encourage. Lord, thank you for this family of, of believers who is always a blessing and encouragement, encouragement to each other. Father, I pray as we come into this new year and as we 
Uh, Lord, just help us to, to seek to know you and to love you more each day. Uh, Lord, as, as so many in Scripture say, to know you and to love you more, to pursue, to run hard after you, Father, during this, this new year, this 2023, Lord. Lord, as we seek your will and, and very um, deep aspects of our, of our future and for our church, Lord, as we look to find a new pastor, Lord, that you would con continue to guide and give, uh, give us patience, give us unity of, of mind, of, of heart, uh, as we make decisions, as we seek, Lord, uh, guide us to the right people, the right group, the right uh, people to reach out to, Lord, so that we might find that person that you are developing, that you are, uh, from, that you will be providing for us, Lord, for this congregation. Lord, we pray for Bob and Patsy Green, that you would bless in their lives and ministries. Lord, you continue to give them strength and health and, and encouragement, Lord, wherever they are. Uh, Lord, I thank, I'm thankful for uh, Mom and Dad being able to get home uh, on their flight safely, and for John, Lord, we pray for his recovery at home. Thankful that he is able to be home. Uh, Lord, thank you for your work and his and his life, and uh, and using the doctors to be able to deal with this massive uh, heart attack. Lord, that he is able to be home, that he's able to be with family, to see his new grandchild. Lord, uh, what a blessing that is. And Lord, we pray for the Peavies as they get ready uh, to travel, and we are excited to, to be with them and to see them. Uh, Lord, help us to, to be, uh, we are looking forward to, to that time, Lord. Thankful for this time of prayer and praise and worship, Lord, and of the hearing, the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dave, that was a real blessing. Is that not a powerful song? Amen. We are so thankful to be able to praise our God like that. Patty and I went out the other night and saw the full wolf moon. They call it wolf according to the almanac because that's the time when wolves go out and howl. I didn't hear one, but I was reminded of the power of our God. What a blessing. If you'll take your Bibles, we're returning to our study in 1 Corinthians. And I'd like you to look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Paul is dealing with immorality exposed in this chapter. And so as you turn there, let me pray. Father, help us to open our hearts and our minds we're thankful, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. We're thankful for our God and for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, may we be open to the working of the Spirit of God today as we look into these passages. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeb Stuart Magruder was one of the figures involved in the Watergate break-in. He was a promising young politician with a good background and with a testimony from his law office of what a good man he was. He came, became confused, though, in the distinction between right and wrong. He was caught up in the Watergate cover-up of the early 70s. When he was sentenced to prison, someone asked him why he did it. And he said, my ambition obscured my judgment. Somewhere between my ambition and my ideals, I lost my compass. How sad. That is what evidently happened to the church in Corinth. The result was a blatant example of immorality that Paul had to deal with in chapter 5 of his first letter. This is perhaps the most interesting chapter of this book so far because Paul begins dealing with the specific problems 
which plagued the Christians in the church at Corinth. He lost his compass. A compass works on magnetism. If a compass is exposed to other magnets or cell phones or many other things, the compass will have reversed polarity. North becomes south, south becomes north without you even realizing it. When my dad I was beginning his summer on the boat that he had. He would bring someone in, hire him, to read through the compass so it would not be affected. When your and my Christian life is exposed to many inputs that pull us away from intentional Bible reading, solid Christian influences, or other positive thing, we will experience reversed polarity in our moral compass. Instead of heading towards the Lord, we drift and then begin to run away. Now remember the context of this letter. It was written to a local church at Corinth. And Corinth as a city was one of the most corrupt and evil cities in all of the world at that time. This ancient city of nearly 500,000 people were known far and wide for its immorality. It was a common saying in Paul's day that it is not for every man to go to Corinth, meaning that not every person could withstand the temptation that permeated the life of this city. <clears throat> Out of that kind of situation, these Christians have been called to commit themselves to the control, discipline, holy lifestyle of a Christian. It won't be hard for us to ma imagine that in the way our world is going, the way schools are going, the way behavior is going, the way politics is going. We need to be committed again to a holy lifestyle. The conflict, the conflict between their context in Corinth and their calling as a Christian led to problems as we shall see below. So number one, let's think about the problem. Take your Bible and look at chapter 5, verse 1. Paul writes, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles or the unbelievers, that a man has his father's wife. How horrifying. But as a Christian and a member of that local church, this man had been called to a life of holiness and a life of purity. Instead, he was living in gross immorality. Bible scholars believe that others knew it as well, and nothing was being done. That was Paul's problem. But secondly, notice the plan. And the plan reveals itself in chapter 5, verse 5. Paul writes, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow, that sounds scary. Well, let's talk about what it really means. 
I believe that Paul had in mind a means and an end when suggesting this plan. The means by which Paul recommended they deal with the problem was to deliver that man over to Satan. Now some denominations and religious groups think of denying the sacraments, shunning that person, humiliating them publicly, <clears throat> but most Bible scholars suggest that this is a strong term for putting them out of the local church. It is a very serious issue. And I remind you, this was given to Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ himself when Paul sat at Jesus' feet for three years out in the desert. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew is writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 50. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That is not often done. To go to a person in humility, in calmness, in quietness, and in privacy, and talk through the issue. If that man hears you, you have gained a brother. Verse 16. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established. And if he refuses to hear them, then tell it to the church. We have done that on occasion over the years I have been here and had to deal in a quiet, private, and then one or two person setting, and then eventually in the church with a number of different issues that came our way. Verse 17 says, if he refuses to hear them, tell it publicly to the church. In a church meeting, with no visitors present, deal with the facts of the issue. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a healer, even and a tax collector. Another, have him be to you like an unbeliever. Now Paul is dealing with means. The means that Paul is giving we see in chapter 5. Throughout the New Testament, Satan is depicted as the ruler of the evil of our world. We often hear the prince of the power of the air. That is Satan. He is real, he is living, he is spirit, and he can influence even believers if we are not careful. Paul said that this unrepentant man ought to be put out of the church into the world where Satan rules, into the world where he will begin to experience his ways. That was the means. The end result that Paul hoped to accomplish is also revealed in the Bible. He wanted to, de to deliver this one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word flesh is contrasted with the word spirit. 
And it's common in the New Testament to see this designation. The flesh is our sinful nature, which we all have, even though we're saved, and it is alive and well and wants to win that battle. But the spirit is that which is dwelling within us, that part of our lives where we seek to live for the Lord. The sinful nature must be dealt with constantly with the new spiritual nature that Christ has given us. This seems to be the point to me. Paul wanted that church to put the man out in the world where Satan rules. Then, when he becomes aware of the error of his ways, when he realizes how much he is missing that Christ could give him, he will turn, he will repent, he will come back, and he will publicly be reinstated in the church. And we have seen that happen as well. What a glorious thing to see a sinning Christian repent and come back. Well, what about us today? That was Corinth, preacher. That's the way it was back in the old days. What about today? Well, the abuse of the system that Paul is giving us here has occurred over 2,000 years. Cruel things have been done to people. Facts have not been carefully assessed. Many would rather gossip than go to the person and help him with his problem. What is essential in our church today is that we recognize the basic principle that provides a foundation for Paul's discussion. What's the principle? Well, that's number three as we work our way through our passage. Our world screams loudly, publicly, and in every medium we know, why should we avoid immorality? <clears throat> why can't I just do what I want to do, as seemingly is being done in almost every corner of our society in America and around the world? Why should we avoid immorality? That's so old-fashioned. You don't know what it's like for us younger people. Let me offer some suggestions. First, we need to avoid immorality because of whose we are. As a believer, you are not your own. The Bible says we have all been bought with a price, and that price was Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins. When we come to faith in Christ, we become servants of the Lord. We should not be in immorality because of whose we are. We are His, and the very nature of servanthood which is what believers are, is that the master calls the shots. Jesus sets the rules. We do not. And there are believers I know, and I've talked to them, and they're always looking for wiggle room. They always want a little way to work around it. But Jesus has called us to a life of purity in every area of our lives. When we chose Christ as our Savior, we chose to follow the path of holiness and the path of purity that he exemplified in his own life. Whatever form immorality may take, it is wrong, it is sin sinful for us 
because we belong to him because of whose we are but secondly we need to avoid immorality because of who we are because we are unleavened we need to clean out the old leaven that we may be a new lump and some may say what in the world is that well look at chapter 5 verse 7 Paul continues and he says therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us leaven as given in the New Testament is the word we would use yeast and when Patty is making her wonderful sourdough bread and with part of that sweet rolls she uses yeast in the recipe if not that bread would be flat as a pancake wouldn't taste good either now in biblical literature leaven was used to signify or be given figuratively to produce an additive that debases or that corrupts the whole by a progressive inward operation because of that leaven that he's talking about was absolutely forbidden in the, with the sacrifices in the Old Testament. The Israelite was forbidden to eat leavened bread or even have leaven in his possession during the Passover season. In rabbinical literature, Old Testament Jewish literature, leaven always symbolized evil desires. And because of that, this is beginning to make more sense. Because Jesus Christ died for sin, we have been declared righteous or acceptable before God. He declared us at the moment you were saved unleavened or clean. Now, because of that, we must put off immorality in any form. Put off the leaven of the world that wants to creep into your sanctified life so that you then begin, begin to live like a righteous man and a righteous woman, regardless of age, because that's what God declared us to be why avoid immorality number three avoid immorality because of how immorality affects others look at the question in verse 6 do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough we see that in verse 6, your glory is not good. Do you not know that that little leaven leavens the whole lump? And when Patty adds yeast, yeast is a living organism. Sounds a little creepy. But the next time you eat a slice of gummy white bread, it had to have le leaven in it. And a little immorality in a person's life can have detrimental effects on the lives of others. Sadly, as a biblical counselor over the years, I have dealt with those who have had sex before marriage and they thought nothing of it. Let's move in, honey. I have dealt with those, that, and this is both men and women, who have had extramarital affairs and, but stayed with their spouse. I've also spent time with those that experiment 
or are immersed with pornography in any way, any form. And then, of course, contrary to our society, those who dabble in or are committed to homosexual or lesbian lifestyles, that's leaven in our world. Experts tell us, and I can bear this to be true, that just a little immorality in a congregation, in a local church, will begin to affect others who are watching us. What you do, what I do, what we say, will influence other people, whether you plan on it or not. Paul is saying we should avoid immorality for it will cause us to be a stumbling block to others. To cause them to say, if he can do it, it might be okay. Why should we avoid immorality? The fourth and last reason I thought about, we should avoid immorality because of what it does to us. The pathway of immorality is not the pathway to freedom. It's a pathway to bondage. It's a pathway to a ruined destruction of your life. One, one pastor told me not long ago, he said, Preacher, it's no use. I just can't shake it, as we talked about immorality. And that was the last time I ever saw him. I don't know what happened. Immorality did not set that young man in Corinth free. Instead, it had restricted him in the worst kind of bondage from which he seemingly could not escape. And I feel that the lesson that you and I need to carry away from this passage is more personal. Because of whose we are, and because of who we are, and because of how immorality affects others, and what it does for us, every one of us needs to avoid immorality in our lives whether it's the internet or the videos you watch or the seemingly innocent paperback books that are usually read by women, whether it's other things that is coming into your life, avoid immorality. Now my personal guidelines are my clothes. And I'm not saying you all ought to do this. I'm saying what I do and what I've committed Patty to, to, that I will do. Number one, I'm never alone with a woman privately. I'm never <laughs> alone with a younger woman privately. Joel or, or Joellen or Rose. I'm never alone. I'm, I will talk to them in a group or I will take Patty with me. Don't I, Patty? Yep, that's my promise. When I talk to a person, usually of the opposite sex, I try to look in their eyes and not, other, not any other area. And that's the same for ladies. I've heard comments by some ladies as they look at another man that was a little shocking to me. I didn't think girls talk like that, but they do. I avoid taking part in suggestive behavior, jokes, flirtatious actions, and words that open myself up to the dangers of immorality that creep in so stealthily because it is Satan that is at work in the lives of believers in our church and in the world. We need to avoid immorality in our lives. 
May we pray. I do not know what you were involved in. I don't want to know. But I know that God knows plainly, fully, and in technicolor. And I pray that if you are dabbling with, or dealing with, or experimenting with this, that you will repent and turn. And I will say, age is no guarantee. Whether you're 60, 70, 80, or more, Satan wants to, re to ruin our lives. Father, I pray that we will leave from here with a new commitment, a new realization. In Jesus' name, amen.